Okay, now let's talk about stress and variance. This is a very important concept, uh, not very difficult, but a very important concept. So, uh, when you're done with this, you should be able to tell us what invariants are. You should be able to describe them both in two dimensions and three dimensions. Uh, and uh, there's also this concept of mean stress and deviatoric stress, which is really important to understanding shear strength, because that's the way we talk about things in shear strength. So you should be able to define those. Um, and finally, there's this concept of the octahedral stress, which I'm going to explain what that is to you in this course, and we're never going to talk about it again in this class, but when you get to shear strength, you're going to talk about it a lot, so you need to know what it is. Um, so that's what you need to know out of this, se this segment. So um, let's talk about invariants. Let's go back to our Mohr circle. We're going to talk about them from a Mohr circle standpoint first. We'll do this in two dimensions, and then we'll just extend it to three dimensions. So remember, this, is my, this was my Mohr circle for that point A that we were talking about. And I've shown on here three different... Um, you know, three different states of stress that you could have. You, got, you could have a state of stress from here. This is the, this is the principal states of stress here, because notice that this, uh, there's a full point, and this one passes through the zero point. Here's the, the uh, x, y ones that we started with, and these are the a, b ones. But those all represent the same state of stress. So there must be something about these three different uh, um, values of the shear normal stresses that's consistent. There must be something that, that doesn't vary between them because they all re represent the same, the same straight state of stress. And I bet I have a bunch of drawing on here that... Um, why aren't you doing what I want you to do? Okay, let's do this. Um, so, um, what isn't changing in this figure? Right? I'm, I'm, I'm looking, I've, got, uh, I've got this square, I've got this square, I've got that square, there's all these lines, but what is not changing in this picture? I could pick another, I could pick another orientation, right? I could pick another orientation. Let's pick this one. Um, right? And I'm going to get another square here, I'm going to have another set of stresses. But in all those, one thing is not changing. What's not changing in the picture? The circle's not changing, right? I'm going to run and run around this circle, and I can get different values, but the one thing that doesn't change is the circle doesn't change. Right? I can get on the merry-go-round. I can get on the, uh, you, can go to the you can go to the fair. You can get on the tilt-a-whirl, whatever. You know, it's going around and around, whatever. But, you know, you can get thrown out on this side, that side. You might go up, you might go down. But whatever, but the only thing that's not changing is that you're going around and around in the same circle. That's the invariant in this system. The circle is not changing. So that's kind of the key to this whole concept. Okay, so what's not changing about this? So wh how, do we how can we describe the circle? How do we describe the circle? By its center and its radius or diameter. So that's it. This is a two-dimensional problem. Guess how many invariants there are? Two. Two dimensions, two invariants. One is the location of the center, the other one is the radius or the diameter. So the location of the center, we already did this, that represents the mean normal stress. You want to think about that's the average compression that, this, that the element's under, right? Because it's sigma 1 plus sigma, uh, uh, sigma z plus sigma x divided by 2, or it's also equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2. Right? It can be any x and z pair, or it can be the normal, it can be the, the, the principal stresses, 1 and 2, right? The other thing that's not changing is the radius of the circle. This is what we call the maxi maximum. It's the, ma the radius represents the maximum shear stress you can have on the circle, right? If you go, let's see if I can do this. Um, where on this, uh, you know, what point on this circle is the shear stress maximum? Right at the, right at the tippy top and right at the, the, the bottom bottom, right? And, and, and notice that the value of tau at this point, right, this, this value right here, is equal to the radius of the circle, right? That's the point of maximum shear stress. So, um, uh, did it again. Mm, go away. If I wait long enough, it'll go away. So um, in terms of any arbitrary x and z, if I just do the geometry, the maximum shear stress is equal to the, the, 
it's the, the, this is the same radius thing we just did, right? Um, so if in terms of the, the, uh, an arbitrary one, it's the square of the difference of the mean stresses uh, plus two times tau squared uh, square root, one half on the outside. Or if I do it in terms of principal stresses, ooh, that was interesting. I didn't know I could do that. If I do it in terms of principal stresses, um, it's just sigma 1 minus sigma 3 divided by 1. That's why it's kind of nice to convert your things to principal stresses first and then do all your equations with principal stresses because there's no tau in that space and it makes the equations easier. But conceptually, you know, those are the, just, just think, it's the, it's the center of the circle, mean stress. The diameter of the circle, the maximum shear stress. Okay, here's my principal, ten, uh, if, if I want to write the, uh, so I can write any state of stress in terms of its principal stress tensor, right? And it's going to be this principle. It's going to be sigma 1. I put sigma 2 here. There should be sigma 3, I think. Sorry about that. Sigma 1 plus sigma 3. I mean, it's going to be sigma 1 and sigma 3, zero shear stresses. Where, where's that on my circle? That's this point on the circle right there. I'm, so, I'm sorry, that's the, the, these two points on the circle right there, right? Where there's no shear stress. Oops, one more. All right, well, I can take any state of stress, any arbitrary state of stress. That, now, that, that circle doesn't have zero shear stress on it. Right? Let me go back to that circle for a second. Is, is there shear stress in this state of stress? Yeah, this, that, 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 that state of stress has shear. There's the planes on which there's no shear stress, but the, the circle has a diameter, right? So it has a maximum shear stress. So someplace in there, there's a shear stress. We could pick a set of axes where there doesn't happen to be any shear stress in that particular plane, but that soil at that position is under shear. We can tell because the circle has a radius that's greater than zero. So I can take the um, I can take the uh, principal stress tensor and I can write it in terms of the mean stress, which is the average compression that it's under, times the unit times the identity matrix I, right, plus some uh, the maximum shear stress times this uh, matrix, which is going to be 1 minus 1. It's actually called the Dirichlet delta function, but I don't want, you know, we don't need to give it a name. Just think of it as, as, as a stress as 1. If I can, and if, because the mean, and if I do this, whoops, um, I, can, I, can, I can break down a, a matrix into uh, its um, mean normal component and its shear component that way. All right, so let's talk about this in three dimensions. Uh, in three dimensions, I'm going to have how many invariants? Three. I got three dimensions. I'm going to get three invariants. Um, and we're not going to. I'm not going to prove these. We're just going to do this by um, uh, by analogy. Uh, and these are the three invariants. I1 is the same concept as uh, in three dimensions as we had in two dimensions. In this case it's equal to uh, the three, 3 times sigma m, right, because it's the, th you know, you could write it as sigma x plus sigma y plus sigma z divided by 3, but normally it's written that way. So it's, re but, it, so but notice that the mean normal stress here is, is 3, you know, it's not 2 times because it's 3 stresses. Uh, and these two are the, uh, these two are the definitions for I2 and I3. They're not as obvious. They still relate. They're, they're related to two things. If you want to think of, if you want to take your more circle for a minute and think of about, think of it as a, um, as a, uh, a rugby ball. So it's an ellipsoid. So uh, it, these two together tell you how big the 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 rugby ball is. In other words, what's the maximum shear stress? And the other one tells you how oblong it is, how much it's bigger in one direction than another. Because there's three dimensions now, so we got another we got another degree of freedom. So if you want to think about it that way, it's not that obvious what they really are. Um, but if we write them in terms of principal stresses, we have these equations. But the concept is the same. So in, in, in two dimensions, in two dimensions we have a circle. All we need is its radius and its center point. In three dimensions, we have this ellipsoid. So we need to know its centroid. That's I1. And then we need to know its radius in one, di one direction, and we need to know the, 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 the aspect ratio in the other direction if you want to think about it, and those are the three things we need to know.
And so that's what the three invariants are. Um, so this is um, three times sigma n. I guess I wrote that already, and I just said this. Um, this is related to the maximum shear stress and the differences between the deviator stresses in two directions. So let's look at deviatoric stress in three directions. So in three dimensions, we've got three devi deviator stresses, or maximum shear stresses, right? You've got sigma 2, um, and we'll just do this in, in um, normal space. You've got sigma 2 minus sigma 3 over 2. You've got sigma 3 minus sigma 1 over 2. And you've got sigma 1 minus sigma 2 over 2. So you've got, you, you know, in, in uh, two dimensions, we only had one because they're the same. But in three dimensions, we've got three of them. Uh, so we can decompose the principal stress tensor then into um, the mean normal, the, 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 the pressure, which is the same as the mean normal stress times an identity matrix, plus tau 1 times the, the Dirichlet delta function between uh, y and z, uh, x and z, tau 2 times the Dirichlet uh, delta function between x and uh, y and then tau 3 between, uh, I'm sorry, z and y and between z and x. And this is important because like when you do a triaxial test, right, you have a triaxial specimen, you do a triaxial test, normally you put, you know, you put normal stresses with no shear stresses. This is going to be sigma 1, this is going to be sigma 3 usually. Um, well, there's shear stress in that, that things under shear stress. There's no shear stress in those two planes and so you can, you can and you, you can divide that thing up into its mean normal stress, which is going to be the average pressure it's under, and then the shear stresses. And if you ha actually were doing a, you know, a, a specimen that was three dimensions, you have three stresses there, and you get three different shear stresses. So it's at least conceptually important. And what else is on this slide? Okay, uh, so the, whoops. So the mean stress is um, just sigma 1 plus sigma 2 plus sigma 3 divided by 3, and that's equal to P in this one. Uh, okay, our final thing to talk about, I think. So we're going to talk about octahedral stress. Oh, and I forgot to load SketchUp. This is something that, that is easier to do if I show you a SketchUp model. I forgot to, so I can't spin the SketchUp model around. But imagine you take your, your XYZ plane, your, your XYZ axis system, and we're going to draw a line that comes out of that that's, that has an equal angle between all. I'm going to draw, take this line, draw it through there, and it has the same angle between um, all three axis systems. So this is my two-dimensional picture of that. So that's, so this is that, this is that direction. And this plane is normal to that, all right? So there's both a shear stress and a normal stress acting on the plane. That's the octahedral stress. Um, and this comes important for von Mises limits and some other things you can talk about in shear strength. Um, oh, and I didn't, uh, oh no, I did change it. Wow, I feel really good. So this, if you want to know the equations for that, they're in that engineering mechanics text I gave you. And it's important for 532, and we're never going to talk about it again, except I think in your homework I make you calculate the octahedral stress. Um, so that's it, and I think that's all we were going to cover today, and like way freaking ahead of schedule. So I, sh I should have spent more time doing the problem. So questions, yeah. Oh, so well, so, so sigma two would be. Um, so we're now talking about three-dimensional states of stress, right? So we're going to have, can I do the pin thing? Well, maybe I can't do the pin thing when I'm zoomed in. Um, let me draw that someplace bigger. So in three dimensions, I'm going to have this, right? So I'm going to have um, 
And let, let's assume that these are the norm, these are the principal planes. I've got this oriented with these. In fact, let, let's get even more arbitrary about it. I think I can do this in an arbitrary angle. Let's. Um, So I've just I've got this some just completely arbitrary orientation, but let's assume that so this is going to be this is going to be one of the one of the principal stresses, okay, and this is going to be another principal stresses, and this is going to be another one. And there's no shear stresses on these plates. I found the ones where they're all oriented properly. Uh, and let's say this one it has a value of ten, and this one has a value of three, and this one has a value of seven. All right? This is the largest one. That's going to be the major principal stress, sigma 1. Okay. Right? This is the smallest one. That's going to be the minor principal stress, sigma 3. Um, this is the intermediate one. That's going to be sigma 2. Normally when, we do, uh, normally when we do more circles, we assume that we're looking at the major and the minor principal stress, because there's only two of them anyway. So this is the place where my notation is wrong, and I should have had a three there. That's interesting that it was on that same page. Um, so that's that's the notation. Sigma one is the major principal stress. Sigma two is the intermediate one, and sigma three is the minor one. So if you're talking about three dimensions, sigma m, whoops, sigma m is equal to sigma one plus sigma two plus sigma three divided by three. Now, if we're dealing with two dimensions, th this becomes a problem uh, that I believe Dr. Young will talk about in um, um, 532. If we're dealing two dimensions, we have sigma m is equal to just to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2, which is okay if we're completely ignoring stresses in the other direction, right? But in, and, and so if we're just talking in a two-dimensional world, we don't care about the third dimension, we're just doing it all mathematically, that works fine. But I never walked around in a two-dimensional world. You know, I've been, I've enjoyed a few chemicals that altered my state of mind occasionally, but I've never been that far, you know. <laughs> um, so, um, I stick with the legal ones, by the way. It's less trouble than the <laughs> illegal ones. Um, but let's look at our, uh, 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 I've only got an extra minute here, let's look at our, our uh, triaxial test, right? So we got our triaxial specimen, and it's in our triaxial test, and, and if you don't know anything about triaxial tests, just bear with me. But I think most people will, will know what's going on. How many stresses do we, ha do we have actually we have control over in the triaxial test? We only got two, right? And so we do this all the time. We just write it down as, a, as, as if it's a two-dimensional test, right? And you got, usually, the, usually this is the bigger one, so we'll call that sigma one, and this is sigma three. Well, sigma three there, the cell pressure actually acts all the way around, right? So the true state of stress is, this is sigma two, and sigma two is equal to sigma three. So the real stress tensor in there is sigma one, sigma two, sigma three, zeros on these sides. And if I want to calculate the mean stress of this system, sigma m is really equal to sigma one plus two times sigma three divided by three. That's the actual mean stress on the sample, right? Well, because we draw this, and, and but normally, I mean, do you do a three-dimensional analysis of the, of the test? No, you do a two-dimensional analysis. You get your more circle out, you draw your thing like this, you know, you draw a couple more circles here, you draw the field envelope, you know, and you only talk about sigma one and sigma three. So lots of times when people plot, uh, and, and you're, gonna, you're going to, um, Dr. Young is gonna talk to you about PQ diagrams, where th and another way to plot the more circles, it's a little more convenient, instead of plotting the circle, because you gotta draw the circle, is you just plot the, um, you, you just plot the peaks of the circle. So if I want to talk about, um, l let's say I want to talk about uh, a, a soil that's, it's in, that's the, where the mean stress and the shear stress are increasing. So it starts with this one, and I load it, I put some load on it, you know, and it, and it changes from that state of stress to this state of stress, and then, you know, maybe it gets even bigger than that. Oops, bad circle. Well, drawing circles is a pain in the butt, so what I can do instead of drawing circles is um, I can just uh, draw 
instead of drawing circles, I can just draw the tops of the circles, right? That uniquely defines the circle. So instead of drawing the, the red thing, I can, I can just draw the, the tops of the circle. And rather than drawing the circles. It's just an easier way to draw the, the stress. The, the uh, if I do that, we call this a PQ diagram because uh, where, this, where P re represents the mean stress and Q represents the deviatoric stress. Well, what is P in this one? Well, if I say P is equal to sigma 1 plus sigma 3 divided by 2, that's fine in two dimensions, but that's not the actual mean stress on the soil, is it? So some people are very careful to say that P is equal, that this is, this is incorrect, and that P is equal to sigma 1 plus 2 times sigma 3 divided by 2. And other people say, well, it doesn't really matter. We're just doing this thing, and it's more convenient to write it the other way. So you're going to find out that when, when you get to uh, 532 and you're talking about shear stress, you talk about PQ diagrams, you got to be very careful that, to, to define how, some, you, to be, how somebody defined P and Q because they're different. You know, it's going it's, to, if you plot, um, if you plot the first one, you're gonna, they're gonna, the points are going to plot out like that. If you plot the second one, you're going to have the same Qs, but you have bigger Ps, and it's going to plot like this, right? Different definition of P and Q. So this is a place where the two-dimensional, three-dimensional thing can really mess you up if you don't pay attention to what's going on. Did not, I went through a big, long explanation about a lot of stuff, and I have no idea if I actually answered your question because we went a lot farther than the question you asked. Because I had time, and I'm trying to sit here and make sure you, get your, you feel like you're getting your money's worth. I'd hate for you to leave early or anything. So, any other questions? Okay. <laughs>